New York Times has a great, great article about how uh, none of the bankers went to jail after the 2008 crash. Now you know that, except that there actually is one person, uh, his name is Kareem Sergeldin, we'll get to him in a second. He was uh, the only Wall Street executive to go to jail. It's funny why he went to jail. Like I said, uh, we'll get to that in one quick second. But I want you to understand context, okay? Now, uh, it hasn't always been this way. In 1929, we had a great crash, right? And not only was there a lot of prosecutions, they arrested the head of the New York Stock Exchange. Can you imagine? Today, people would be like, how dare you? Such a beloved and important person. It's important to the global economy. They wouldn't even think about it. Well, not so distant few, uh, past, it was uh, the savings and loans crisis in the 1980s. Even though that was the Reagan administration, there was 1,100 people who were prosecuted. And the savings and loan debacle was terrible, but it was basically a drop in the bucket compared to what happened in 2008. We had 1,100 prosecutions. Now, only one. Amazing. Okay, so how has things been going instead? Instead of doing the actual prosecution, you did criminal act, you did this was obvious fraud, you said to investors that you were in great financial shape, we find out the next day you were in terrible financial shape, you see that's fraud, right? No, 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 of course, they let all that go. Um, instead, they started doing what is called deferred non-prosecution agreements. Now, if you're a criminal out there and you don't happen to be a rich Wall Street banker, wouldn't you love that? Yes, I'll take a non-prosecution agreement. <laughs> okay, where do I get that deal? Well, on Wall Street. So now, in the past, this was very rare. What happened from time to time, in a 12-year stretch, 1992 to 2004, it happened 26 times, okay? Now, um, how many times did it happen between 2004 and 2012? 242 times, okay? So first period is 12 years, the second period is eight years, and you can see the gigantic difference nonetheless. How about white collar prosecutions? Well, in the mid 1990s, of all federal cases, 17.6% were white collar prosecutions, not bad. Between 2009 and 2012, by the way, those are the Obama years, down to 9.4% of all federal cases. In other words, white collar prosecution, eh, not so interesting. So now let me show you the one guy who was prosecuted. His name is Kareem Sergeldin, and that's actually relevant here. Uh, he happens to be ethnically Egyptian, and he thought, look, man, I work at Credit Suisse, and uh, they have some information on me, and I've got this Muslim-sounding name. It was such a global economic collapse. I, I, I better uh, plead guilty and throw myself at the mercy of the court. He was the only sucker who pled guilty. The only reason he was convicted was because he confessed. Dummy. Think about it, he was 41 when he got convicted. That means that all this stuff happened when he was in his 30s. So they didn't get anybody at Lehman Brothers, they didn't get anybody at all these giant banks that failed, all the Merrill Lynch's, et cetera, right? The, the Goldman Sachs, the JP Morgan's, the guys who drove this. They got a 30 some odd year old executive at a Credit, Credit Suisse was a big bank globally, but mid-sized here in the US. And that's the only guy they got. And only because he had a Muslim sounding name, he was scared witless, and he pled guilty. <laughs> you know what that means. They weren't really trying. So now let's investigate why they weren't trying. And this is where it gets interesting, why? So first, they brought in Lanny Brewer into the Obama Justice Department. Now this is the, these are the guys who were gonna bring you change. You know, Bush brought you this disaster and they didn't do anything about it and then the Obama guys were gonna get tough and they called Lenny Brewer's team the Brew Crew. Oh, they were coming, right? And he came with a fancy, he came from a fancy uh, law firm called Covington and Burling, which by the way, represents white collar defendants, which makes a ton of money representing those same bankers that he's now theoretically going to prosecute. Well, let's see if it turned out that way. Well, here are six reasons that I have distilled from this really great piece, and from what I know in the past as well, uh, from the New York Times piece and uh, previous articles that I've read. Uh, they say in this piece, and something that I did not expect, but they made a lot of good points about. It. Initially, the Bush crew was too tough. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the Obama uh, team wanted to maintain their clean records of prosecution. The Supreme Court kept siding with corporations. I'm gonna explain the details of all of these. The Treasury Department put pressure uh, on uh, the Obama administration not to prosecute. There were budget cuts, that meant that they had less money to prosecute with. 
And of course, the most important reason, the brew crew and all the other guys who worked there couldn't wait to go back to the private sector where they would make a ton of money from the guys who they chose, just a wild coincidence, not to prosecute here. So, now how is the Bush crew too tough? So this is interesting. Even Michael Chertoff, who at the time uh, was in the Bush Justice Department, actually went after Arthur Anderson aggressively after Enron. So you remember the Enron, the Tycos, and all those scandals? The Bush guys actually did a pretty good job with them. Uh, in fact, they were so enthusiastic in the prosecutions, and if the Bush team was good at anything, they were good at going after the bad guys, whether sometimes they were actually bad guys or not, right? They loved being aggressive. They went enhanced interrogation on these guys, okay? And they actually overstepped a little bit. So I, I love their prosecutions of uh, the Tyco guys, the Enron guys, and all the guys who did fraud, and Arthur Anderson, the accounting firm that helped uh, to do all that fraud. In fact, Arthur Anderson, they got a criminal conviction against them, and the company went under. But that caused a little bit of a panic. Everybody was like, oh my God, they lost 10,000 jobs. Yeah, but they said, they would say, and that's what pissed off Chertoff and the Justice Department, they would say like, oh yeah, yeah, they can't put us under, they'll give us a slap on the wrist, they'll give us one of these deferred prosecutions and we'll move on with our lives. And to great credit of the Bush Justice Department, in that case, they were like, mm, I don't think so. We're gonna do significantly more. So uh, Arthur Anderson went under, but they should have. They kept doing one fraud after another after another, and they would rub it in the government's face like, hey, you're never gonna do anything about it. Now, then the prosecutors got a little overzealous, and they tried to take away uh, attorney-client privilege, which I know the banks were abusing. But that wasn't gonna fly with the Supreme Court or with any court, and they tried to, stop the getting the employees to pay for the legal fees of their executives. Now, I, I would like those actions too, but realistically they weren't gonna be able to do that legally, and when they overreached, then they started getting some of their convictions overturned. And even Arthur Anderson, the Supreme Court, after they had gone under, said because of technical issues like that, they overturned that conviction. So then, the Bush guys initially, and then definitely the Obama guys, started getting cold feet. Oh my God, what if we lose a case? What if we lose a case? We don't want to ruin our perfect record. Oh God. Because if they have a good, clean record, then they can go brag about that and make even more money. Now, again, to Bush's credit here, and I was surprised by this, to be honest with you, but good reporting in the New York Times. Uh, Robert Mueller comes in, and so does uh, Sky uh, Thompson, who, of course, uh, Bush calls by his... Um, initials LT. Uh, they're both, you know, at the FBI, Mueller is, and Thompson's a part of the prosecution. They showed them how they actually did do real fraud and cook the books, etc. And they asked Bush for permission to go after the bad guys in the white collar cases. Now, Republicans being what they are, you might think they would take it easy on them. No. Bush listens to it and goes, Bobby and LT, continue what you're doing. I like it. Okay, now if they had had Cheney in the room, it might have been a different reaction. But Bush being the guy like, oh really? They cooked the bucks. I didn't know that. Okay, you keep going LT and Bobby. Okay, probably the only guy I ever called Robert Mueller Bobby, but anyway, he's the president, he gets to do that. So that's great though, great. Uh, now, we start getting in the Obama years, and what happens? Mm, they don't like losing. And they're maybe even more corporate than the Bush guys. Former federal prosecutors say, well, quote, politicos, care about winning and losing, so they started paying a lot more attention to that. Now, uh, when you go back to a former prosecutor under George Bush, what do they say about clean records? Quote, we have a name for prosecutors who've never lost, the chicken shit club. <laughs> Damn, and that's ex exactly right. That means you don't take any tough cases. You don't lose any uh, cases because you only took the easy ones. Now, um, when you go back to the Obama administration, and you know, look, anybody who watches this show knows I am no fan of the Bush administration. I've criticized them 128, no, I'm literally actually underestimating when I say 128 different ways. But credit where credit is due. Now you go to the Obama guys. He says, a former prosecutor at the Justice Department in Washington concurred that Brewer staff didn't want to pursue cases where they feel the person is 100% guilty, but they're only 70% sure they can win a trial. Ridiculous. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why uh, they didn't pursue these bankers. Another reason is the Supreme Court. Not only did they overturn the Arthur Anderson decision, they came in at one of the cases and they said, now, whenever it's one of you guys, uh, like you remember the Stephanie George case, tiny bit, uh, amount of uh, 
uh, drugs sold in the beginning. Her third strike is something that is clearly planted by her uh, boyfriend who's a drug dealer. Uh, but the judge says, look, I feel terrible about this, but I don't have a choice. I gotta give you the mandatory minimum, which is a life sentence. When it came to the executives and to the co corporations, Supreme Court says, no, 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 you can violate the mandatory minimums. You can go lower than the minimum. Because the Supreme Court is totally pro-corporations and they're blocking everything and helping them in that way. Okay, so that's another huge problem. Now, the Treasury Department. A top Treasury Department official told Brewer, in carefully couched language, that an indictment could cause broader problems in the financial system. Now, that was in the case of HSBC. HSBC was the bank that uh, laundered about $6 billion worth of drug cartel money from Mexico and other nations. It's the biggest case of drug cartel money laundering in world history. Free to go. Stephanie George sold about $160 worth of drugs that she actually did. Life sentence, sorry, there's nothing we can do. Mandatory minimum, life sentence. HSBC, you do $6 billion worth, you're free to go. It could cause problems for the global economy. Yeah, they had to pay a fine. Did anyone actually go to jail? Of course not. Stephanie George was in jail. By the way, her sentence was commuted, which we are, are ecstatic about, right? But all those people who uh, did not commit violent offenses, but drug offenses in jail, oftentimes for life sentences, these guys, no one got prosecuted criminally. Okay, then another Republican trick this time. They would say, oh, look at that. We ran out of budget money. Mm. We're gonna have to do a periodic hiring freezes at all the places that do enforcement of white collar crime. <laughs> what a coincidence. Whether it's federal prosecutors, the SEC, or even the Postal Service. Did you know that the Postal Service had an elite unit that specialized in complex financial investigations and they were badasses and they would go get the, the worst of the worst in white collar crime? Now that begins to explain a little more as to why uh, the Republicans were on a war path against the Postal Service. Wasn't that weird? Ah, goddamn Postal Service! Turns out, after they hammered them and hammered them, they started running out of money, and the first thing they closed down was this elite unit that goes after white collar criminals. Mission accomplished. You see how both parties working together to make sure Wall Street walks? So, now, one of the ways that they uh, took money away is President Obama's, as the New York Times explains here, President Obama's Fraud Enforcement and Recovery Act, which was designed to give hundreds of millions to prosecute financial criminals, was able to deliver only 65 million in 2010 and 2011. Less resources, also at the IRS, also attacked by Republicans. IRS, scandal, scandal. Oh, look at that, you have less money. Oh, you can't go after tax evaders. You can't go after white collar criminals. You can't go after our Wall Street bankers who coincidentally both fund our campaigns and then hire all the people working at all these different departments as soon as they leave. And that's the final twist I'll get to in a second. But to make all this incredibly clear, our own Attorney General, Eric Holder, under um, President Obama, during Senate testimony, said this. I am concerned the size of some of these institutions become so large that it does become difficult for us to prosecute them when we are hit with indications that if we do prosecute, if we do bring a criminal charge, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. So there's the guys at the Treasury Department telling the guys at the Justice Department, don't you dare prosecute our banker buddies, because it would cause grave concerns for the global economy. Now, most of the guys who worked at the Treasury Department, both under Bush and Obama, now work for, you guessed it, Wall Street. Now, we turn back to Lanny Brewer, who was supposed to be the chief uh, enforcement on the criminal side here uh, at the Justice Department to go get these guys. Oh, the Brew Crew! Well, it turns out, after he decided not to prosecute any of the top bankers except for Kareem, who's sitting in jail now, guess where he went to go work? Shocking. Turns out he's now vice chairman at Covington and Burley, the same law firm where he defended bankers. He now has an even better position that pays even more money defending bankers. Gee, I wonder why none of the bankers got prosecuted after 2008. This is our deeply corrupt system in America.